My name is Eugene Lux, and I'm in the computer science department at the University of Oregon. My very good friend, Laszlo Babai, asked me to introduce his lecture today. It is really an honor to do so. Lazzi was educated in Hungary, rigorously mentored by disciples of Paul Erdős. He earned his PhD in 1975. In 1979, Lazzi set out for an extended visit to, to North America. In the course of that visit, he compiled results into a paper entitled Monte Carlo Algorithms and Graph Isomorphism Testing. I trace my own start in computer science to that single paper. My research at the time was in Lie algebras, but I was on leave in 1979 and sitting in on John Hopcroft's Cornell lectures on algorithm complexity. In a discussion of the power of randomization, Hopcroft brought out a manuscript just obtained from some young Hungarian mathematician. The paper was a compendium of new ideas, including novel group theoretic methods. In fact, I have to tell you, I still assign it to graduate students. However, Hopcroft was focusing on a procedure for which the author had coined the new term Las Vegas algorithm. Roughly, a Las Vegas algorithm involves coin tossing, but will either certify a correct result or report failure, in which case it can be rerun. Thus, the problem was in polynomial time only via randomization. But the underlying algebra was, com was compelling, and I took that as a challenge. It turned out that Lotzi's group theoretic structure can be built without coin tossing. However, Lotzi's methods had forecast a paradigm shift for graph isomorphism. A new link was established between computational complexity and group theory. This led to our first collaboration. This was during spring break in 1980. Unfortunately, that was Lotzi's final week before returning home. For a while, communication was tedious as snail mail to Budapest was piteously slow. Nevertheless, our association flourished after that, and it's through almost four decades now. But during those years, Lazzi was simultaneously making waves in other areas. In particular, he co-introduced the concept of interactive proof. Uh, unexpectedly, that changed our understanding of approximation algorithms. And this revolutionized combinatorial optimization and initiated one of the most active areas in the theory of computing. In 1993, Lazzi shared the inaugural Gödel Prize for that innovation. There's not enough time, obviously, to enumerate his many contributions. But in a nutshell, in 2015, Lazzi was awarded the Knuth Prize, which recognizes a lifetime of impact on the theory of computing. Through all of those achievements, Lazzi did not abandon his first love, graph isomorphism. In September 2015, three months after receiving that Lifetime Knuth Prize, Lotzi made a breakthrough unparalleled, unparalleled in the theory of computing. He reduced the complexity of graph isomorphism from moderately exponential, where it had stagnated for over three decades, to quasi-polynomial. In a popular blog, Scott Aronson called this a transition from the suburbs of exponential time to the suburbs of polynomial time. Graph isomorphism has occupied a special place in computational complexity from the earliest studies of P and NP. So such a landslide change in complexity status was totally unanticipated. News of the result spread like wildfire, first via the social media, and then via a multitude of science magazines. A local seminar at the University of Chicago overwhelmed the venue with an audience of over 200. And that enthusiasm persisted through numerous speaking invitations throughout the US and abroad. Next summer, Lotzi will present the results in Brazil at the International Congress of Mathematicians, which will be his third ICM presentation. I present to you Laszlo Babai, who will speak on groups, graphs, algorithms, the graph isomorphism problem. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. So let me jump to the middle of the subject right away. I'm going to speak about graphs. So a graph is just a network of nodes and links. The nodes are usually called vertices, and, and the links are called edges. And link nodes are called neighbors, or also we say they are adjacent vertices. So this adjacency relation is a symmetric uh, and irreflexive relation. 
And two graphs are isomorphic if there is an isomorphism between them, and isomorphism is a bijection of the sets of vertices that preserves the adjacency relation. Here is one of the most beautiful graphs in existence. It's called the Petersen graph. Uh, and now let's look at the isomorphism problem. So here you see two graphs. One of them is clearly the Petersen graph, and the other is another graph. And now we want to see uh, whether they are isomorphic. So I put a third copy down there, and now let's see what happens. Okay, so that's what it means that they are isomorphic. Uh, so, um, okay, we are not only interested in, in establishing whether or not two graphs are isomorphic, we want to also see the set of isomorphisms uh, between them. This is the set of bijections that preserve adjacency. Uh, this is in particular an interesting concept when we, when we look at it for a graph and itself. So then, then we, so the self isomorphisms are called automorphisms, and the automorphisms form a permutation group acting on the set of vertices. And here is a little exercise for you: uh, prove that the automorphism group. So Petersen graph is very highly symmetric. It has 120 automorphisms, and that automorphism group is isomorphic to the symmetric group of degree five. The set of all, the group of all permutations of five elements. Okay, there is a more general class of graphs that is related to this. It is the class of Johnson graphs, which is going to prominently feature in this theory. A Johnson graph has two parameters, k and t, where k is greater than twice t, and it has k choose t vertices. Naturally, k choose t vertices, then they will be labeled by t subsets of a set of k elements. So I take a set of k elements, and with every subset of size t, I associate a vertex of my new graph. And now I have to tell you what is the adjacency relation between these vertices. Two of them are adjacent if their labels, those t element subsets, differ minimally. I just take out one point of them and add one other. Uh, it is easy to see, it's, it's immediate, that the symmetric group of degree k acts on this graph, namely we permute those elements, uh, the elements of the uh, k set, then that naturally permutes all of its subsets, so it permutes the subsets that correspond to vertices of uh, the Johnson graph, and it preserves the difference of these sets, therefore it preserves adjacency. One can also show that actually this is the full group of automorphisms. So the automorphism group of the uh, Johnson graph is isomorphic to the symmetric group of degree k, and it acts on k choose t elements. Now an interesting thing is the smallest, uh, smallest non-trivial example of this is, uh, corresponds to parameters 5 and 2. And the Johnson graph is parameters 5, choose, five 2, which has 5 choose 2 vertices, 10 vertices. That's not the Petersen graph, it is the complement of the Petersen graph. So how do we get the complement of a graph? First, we complete the graph to the complete graph. So I added orange edges so that now every pair of vertices is adjacent. The original edges are black, the new edges are orange. And now I delete the black ones and that's the complement of the graph. So that complement is the Johnson graph with uh, uh, parameters 5 and 2. Obviously, the automorphism groups of these two graph, uh, graphs, uh, the Petersen and these complements, are the same. Okay, so uh, what is the graph isomorphism problem? I am given two graphs, and I want to know, are they isomorphic or are they not? Uh, what can we say about the complexity of this problem? Obviously, it is not greater than uh, roughly n factorial. We try all n factorial bijections, check all of them, uh, that's, uh, that's the uh, uh, full enumeration uh, solution. A highly non-trivial algorithm, which is moderately exponential, was worked out by Gene Lux uh, four decades, uh, me? Three, three decades or so, three and a half decades ago, yeah. So um, uh, I would call it moderately exponential. This has square root of n in the exponent. I would call it moderately exponential if that was third root of n or tenth root of n in the exponent. So as long as it's a, a constant power of n. But actually, it was not improved from square root to third root. It just stood at this square root n log n uh, until uh, recently. So the, the new result uh, is that actually uh, it works in quasi-polynomial time. Quasi-polynomial means exponential in a constant power of the logarithm of uh, the number of vertices. So uh, the big O hides a constant factor, and the constant in the exponent, if we put one there, then we get polynomial uh, time, and, and if it is a greater constant, we get uh, what we call quasi-polynomial time. Okay, so <clears throat> why, why, why are we looking at graphs? 
Well, uh, isomorphism is a natural concept. If you look at any textbook in algebra, uh, group theory, rings, etc. in page two, you see the definition of isomorphisms. We are in, what we are interested in virtually in every subject about finite structures is isomorphism invariant properties. So the question is natural, but why graphs? Why are we not looking at isomorphisms of rings or semigroups instead? And the reason is that uh, graphs are universal. Graph isomorphism is universal over the isomorphism problems of explicit structures. So for instance, if we want to test two semigroups, are they isomorphic, we can reduce that to the graph isomorphism problem in the following manner. To every semigroup, we can associate a graph such that this graph can be computed in polynomial time given the multiplication table of the semigroup. That's the first thing. And the second is that two semigroups are isomorphic if and only if the corresponding graphs are isomorphic. So this reduces the isomorphism problem from semigroups to graphs. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's look at a few properties of graphs that have been extensively studied. Hamiltonicity, a graph is called Hamiltonian if it has a Hamilton cycle. A Hamilton cycle is just a closed walk that passes through every vertex exactly once. So this picture demonstrates that the flattened dodecahedron is a Hamiltonian graph. And now here is an exercise for you, proof that the Petersen graph is not Hamiltonian. The trouble with this is that you won't, be, won't have such an easy time demonstrating to me that your answer is correct, because, okay, how do you show that something does not exist? Um, all right, colorability, so a legal coloring of a graph is an assignment of colors to every vertex such that adjacent vertices always get different colors. And the graph is called three colorable if three colors suffice for this. So for instance, this picture demonstrates that the Petersen graph is indeed three colorable. Okay, so all these were examples of the class of problems called NP. NP is the class of decision problems for which the yes answer has a short and easily verified witness. So for instance, for Hamiltonicity, the witness will be the Hamilton cycle itself. Somebody gives me a purported Hamilton cycle, I can easily verify that that's indeed a Hamilton cycle. Same for three colorability, same for graph isomorphism. If somebody presents an isomorphism to me, then I will easily verify uh, that it is an isomorphism. Uh, planarity of a graph, if I can do a plain drawing and show it, uh, factoring integers. Now, factoring integers into prime factors is not a decision problem. The answer is not yes or no. But there is a related decision problem so that if we could solve that decision problem efficiently, then we would be able to solve also uh, the, the problem of finding the prime factors. This decision problem is this. Our input is not one integer, but two integers, x and y, and then decide whether or not x has a non-trivial divisor that is less than or equal to y. Here, that divisor is going to be the witness. So this is also a problem in NP. An easy fact is that every problem in NP can be solved in exponential time. You just cycle through all potential witnesses and check whether or not one of them works. The complexity class P is the set of uh, decision problems that are solvable in polynomial time, so that's our theoretical uh, benchmark of efficiency. And the decision problem is NP complete if all problems in the class NP can be reduced in polynomial time to that problem in the same spirit as, as uh, this reduction from semigroup isomorphism to graph isomorphism was. So uh, these are in some sense the hardest problems in NP. So the big discovery of 1972 was natural NP complete problems, uh, satisfiability and tiling um, uh, that Cook and Levin uh, found. And, and, and the one million dollar conjecture, that's, that's actually literally million dollars, is that a class P is not equal to NP. In other words, it is easier to, uh, it is harder to find a solution to a puzzle than to verify somebody else's solution. Um, in other words, NP complete problems cannot be solved in polynomial time. Okay, now CARP within a year came up with an incredible list of NP-complete problems, virtually everything in combinatorial op uh, optimization that you would be interested in. The decision version of those problems are NP-complete. Uh, 
there were just a precious few exceptions, like planarity. Planarity can be solved in polynomial time. Now, uh, P is a subset of NP, so, so problems that are solvable in polynomial time, that's, that's within that class, um, but, but of, uh, among the interesting problems in, in combinatorial optimization, virtually all of them will be NP-complete. Well, what about graph isomorphism and factoring? These problems are not expected f uh, to be NP-complete. There are strong theoretical reasons uh, for uh, uh, expecting that they are not, and they are not known to be in P. So this unresolved complexity status that has persisted for, uh, for decades, <clears throat> this is what lent uh, a great deal of fascination uh, to these problems. Um, okay, so I sort of I told you why we should be looking at the graph isomorphism problem, and now let me tell you something about how. So the strategy is the algorithmic technique known as divide and conquer. Um, what does that mean? We have a problem instance of size n, and we want to reduce it to a moderate number of instances of significantly smaller size. Significantly smaller, think of it as 0.9, so we want to reduce the problem instance by 10%. Um, and now this comes at a multiplicative cost, which is the number of smaller instances to which we reduce. So this kind of reduction leads to the recurrence that if f of n denotes the um, cost of processing an instance of, of size n, and q of n is this branching factor, how many smaller instances we need to uh, consider before we give the answer, then the recurrence is clearly that f of n is at most this branching factor times f of 0.9 times n. So that's why I call it the multiplicative cost. Well, here is uh, a picture for this. Uh, this. This rectangle indicates the original input. It is sort of large. And then we reduce it to a moderate number of smaller instances. And then, of course, recursively, we continue that. We rec uh, but how many levels can this recurrence have? It cannot more than logarithmic number of levels. You cannot reduce n by a factor of 0.9 more than a logarithmic number of times. So the solution to this, under the natural assumption that q of n is monotone, is that f of n is at most a logarithmic power of the branching factor of the multiplicative cost. So what did we accomplish here? If the, the branching factor is quasi-polynomially bounded, then so is the solution also. So this is a seemingly uh, significant progress in the way we view the problem. We don't have to solve the problem in quasi-polynomial time. All we have to do is we have to reduce, we have to significantly reduce the problem size at quasi-polynomial multiplicative cost. So our goal is not to solve the problem, but to reduce the problem size at uh, moderate multiplicative cost. Okay, so that's, that's our modified target. Okay, so now how do we tell two graphs apart? Okay, so here are two graphs. Uh, you can obviously see that it is, it is they are isomorphic. But uh, we don't want to try all the n factorial possibilities. One thing we notice, there is some irregularity here. Uh, the degree of a vertex is the number of neighbors of that vertex. So there is a vertex on the top which has degree one, then, is the, then its neighbor, its sole neighbor has degree three, and all the others have degree two. So we, we encode this into colors. So green now means it, the vertex has degree one, red means the vertex has degree uh, three, and then all the rest have degree two. But then the neighbors of the red vertex are going to notice, oh, I have a red neighbor. Let's encode that information as blue. And then now there are the remaining two vertices that notice, oh, I have a blue neighbor, and myself, I am not red. Okay, good, so let's call that yellow. So we split up the graph. We first notice some irregularity, and then we allow this irregularity to propagate, and that divided up the graph into, into smaller parts. That's what we are looking for. We are looking for breaking up the graph somehow into smaller parts, and the result is a canonical coloring. Now, canonicity means that the procedure that gave us this, that, that the result, the outcome, is such that if you do it to two graphs, then isomorphisms preserve the colors that we got. So if originally we had an isomorphism between the two graphs that did not have any colors on them, 
that isomorphism is still going to preserve these colors that we got afterwards. So that's what I mean by canonical coloring. Okay, we used irregularity. This is an example of a regular graph. Every graph has degree three. Can we do something in this case? Well, yes, we can notice that the four vertices in the middle, they have, they are no, no, there is no triangle attached to those four vertices and to all the other vertices there are triangles attached, so they are different. So we already managed to break up the set into these two subsets. Of course, we could then, then further break them up, but uh, that's not my concern. What I just want to see is, are we able to just somehow get a good breakup? A good breakup would be something which does not have a dominant color. So dominant color, if 90% if of the points have the same color, that's, that's too big for me. I want to break it up so that none of the colors have 90%. Now it is conceivable that we have a dominant color and we can still do something, like we can do a good equipartition. Okay, let's see what happens. This is a graph with 16 vertices, and if you color the vertices by degree, then you get two colors. There are the red colors outside, 12 of them, and, and there are the four in the middle. Okay, let's change the 90% threshold to 75%. It's an arbitrary number that's strictly greater than half. And so, so then I see that the red now is a dominant color. And, and I can't, can't further subdivide this in any way, except that uh, what I notice is that I can find a canonical partition. So it's not the individual blocks of this partition that are canonical, but the partition itself is canonical. So this partition, if I look at an isomorphism of this original graph to another one, then this partition is preserved. Okay, all right, so these two goals are reasonable ways of breaking up a graph, and uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, just for a moment make, make this canonicity concept a little bit more precise. Uh, a canonical assignment of any structure to my graph is something that, that has to be a functor. It has to be a functor from the category of isomorphisms of graphs to the isomorphisms of the associated structures, colors, equipartitions, uh, or any other structure that we might have. And so here is the usual diagram that would illustrate this, uh, um, uh, how we get a functor from, say, graphs to colored sets or partition sets or whatever else. Okay, so once again, we made use of, use of irregularity, and in this graph, we still found some kind of irregularity by looking at triangles that, that uh, are attached or not attached to vertices. But what if there is no discernible irregularity in our graph? What can we then do? Well, for instance, Peterson's graph is a case uh, that is very difficult to point out what kind of irregularity there might be. Well, if there is no irregularity, we create irregularity. We individualize a vertex. We put a little red star on that vertex. Okay, now the neighbors notice, oh, I have a little red star right next to me. And then let's call that green. And so uh, the process star stops here. The remaining six vertices will not be able to distinguish, uh, there is nothing that distinguishes them from one another. So we might not be satisfied with this and then we can individualize a second vertex. Now we have a little blue one, and then we do the exact same process, and where it ends up is that now every color class has at most two vertices in it. Okay, we could say that, okay, that really broke up the graph successfully. And we did that at the cost of individualizing two vertices. Why is that a cost? Because individualization comes at a multiplicative cost. Well. Uh, these two copies of the Peters and graphs are no longer isomorphic because I put a red star on one of them and the red star must be preserved by isomorphism, so I have to individualize one vertex of the other. This vertex, or this, or, or which? I mean, I can't tell which. So that's the problem. If I individualize a vertex, then that incurs a multiplicative cost of n, where n is the number of vertices. And if I individualize t vertices, then the cost of field, that will be n to the t. What we can afford then is individualizing a polylogarithmic number of vertices. If our target is a quasi-polynomial time algorithm, that's what, what we can afford. Okay, so <clears throat> then the question is, if I am given a non-trivial regular graph, 
can we find a canonical good coloring or a canonical good equipartition at a moderate multiplicative cost? Once again, a good coloring is a coloring that doesn't have a dominant color. And if there is a dominant color, then a good equipartition will be that that dominant color we partition, we, di we, we divide it up into equal parts. Okay, now if you think a little bit about it, you see that, okay, I mean, why does this matter? There is no clear reduction of graph isomorphism to the subgraphs induced by color classes or to a, whatever quotient graph you could define if you have a partition. And indeed, there is no, there is no way to, to just do a direct reduction. Yet, <laughs> the fact is that graph isomorphism actually can be reduced to this question. So if somebody gives a solution to this question that is efficient, we shall have an efficient graph isomorphism algorithm. Well, substitute group theory for pure magic. Uh, Okay, so then let's go back to the question. So if you believe in magic, then you now believe that this is a reasonable goal to, to find a good coloring or can find a good equipartition. So can we find one of these things at modest uh, multiplicative cost? Well, I claim the results, so you would expect that I will say yes. Uh, well, the answer is unfortunately no. The Johnson graphs that I mentioned at the beginning, they are tremendously resilient to good partitioning. So here is again the definition of Johnson graphs. And the Johnson graphs have, uh, so they have these two parameters, they have k-choose vertices, and the multi one can prove that the multiplicative cost of a good coloring or a good partition is exponential in k over t. Now, I'd like to emphasize that the case when t is equal to two, that's a very important case. If t is equal to two, then k choose t is quadratic in k, so k is about square root of n. So what you see there, the formula uh, is, uh, the big omega is the inverse of the big O, so that means just a, a constant factor that is a lower bound now. So the cost of good coloring would be exponential in square root of n. And that square root of n is largely responsible for the 30 years that, that, that really of no progress on this problem. But there is good news. The good news is that the only obstruction to good partitioning and good coloring is the Johnson graphs. So what we have is now not two possible outcomes, but three possible outcomes. If we have a non-trivial regular graph, then one can individualize at most a polylog number of vertices and obtain either a good canonical coloring or a good equipartition or a canonically embedded Johnson graph on the dominant color class. Now, what that, uh, does that exactly mean? Uh, is that Johnson graph somehow already a subgraph of the origin? No, it is not a subgraph. It's hidden, but we bring it out by canonical operations. So let's look at this picture. Uh, something may be hiding here. Maybe you see, maybe you don't. Uh, but let's first color the vertices by degree. Then that's what we get, okay? We have red vertices and, 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 and yellow vertices, and the red vertices are dominant. Now, however, I can sort of dim the edges between yellow and red, and now you begin seeing something. You begin seeing that there is a, a, a copy of Peterson's graph hiding there, but that's not a Johnson graph. Oh, that doesn't matter, because we can do canonical operations. Complementation is one of the canonical operations, and now here we have the Johnson graph J52 hiding there. So this graph was not there originally. It's not a subgraph of it, but it is definable from our graph. And that's the point here. And that kind of graph, the theorem says, we can actually find. OK, now the next question you might ask. You, you sort of believe me, I wave my hand about this, <clears throat> that good coloring is a good thing. Good equipartition is a good thing. But if I brought forward a hidden Johnson graph, what good is that? Well, okay, by magic, okay, let's look at this. I had n vertices. It has potentially n factorial permutations that I would need to check. But once that, that, that Johnson graph is there, I am reduced to the automorphism of the, of the Johnson graph. There are only k factorial of rows, so my n factorial goes down to k factorial. But k is, about, is less than square root of n. So I reduced my problem size 
from n not to 0.9 times n, to square root of n. That's an absolutely dramatic reduction. I would love to keep doing that. Well, the re recurrence does, is not going to give me always that possibility, only sometimes, but that would be, that's, that's, that would be even more uh, efficient. Okay. So now let me get to the magic part. Uh, that's group theory. And if there is a magic, there is magic, then there must be a magician. So the magician just introduced me here. Uh, the, we owe the in-depth use of group theory to one paper that was written by Gene Lux in 1980. Uh, the title says the main theorem, isomorphism graph, uh, of, of, of graphs of bounded degree can be tested in polynomial time. So this is the single most important paper you will ever read about graph isomorphism. And uh, more importantly even, it introduced an entirely new method, group theoretic divide and conquer algorithms that lead to this result. Now, what we don't use in the current work is uh, Gene's result. So graphs of bounded degree play no role in this algorithm. What we do use, however, is his method. That method is wired into the genes of the new algorithm. Okay. So first of all, how does group theory come into this at all? Let me define another problem, which we call string isomorphism problem. A string is just a set of positions, and in each position, there is a letter. So for instance, this one here, uh, I designed this for, for an audience in Boston. <laughs> okay, so I permute this. I got another string. So if I apply a permutation to the positions, then any string turns into another string. Okay, I put the operator in the exponent. Now we are going to make a twist on this. This was just anagrams. Anagrams, but we have to do anagrams uh, with respect to a given group of permutations. So I have just a subgroup. I am not allowing for my anagram any permutation. I am only allowing it to come from a given group. I will call that the ambient group. And so I will say that two strings are G isomorphic, where G is a permutation group acting on the set of positions if it trans uh, there is an element in the group that transfers one of them into the other. So the string isomorphism problem is to decide whether or not two strings are isomorphic under such a permutation from the given group. So this problem also was proposed by Jean in 1980. Uh, a nice way of illustrating this problem is that imagine that I have a Rubik's Cube which is not colored like this. It's not colored by the standard colors. Maybe it only has two colors. Maybe every, every little square is red or blue. And then you have another one. And now tell me whether or not it is possible to turn one of them by legal moves into, into the other. All of a sudden, the problem becomes a lot harder. And in fact, this is going to be a prototype of the uh, string isomorphism problem. OK, but why are, am, am I talking about the string isomorphism problem? Uh, oh, I see. I'll defer that for a, another slide. But right now, I'd like to say the result. So string isomorphism, that's going to be the main result. String isomorphism is decidable in quasi-polynomial in quasi -polynomial time. The previous best result was, again, moderately exponential. It was exponential in about square root of n. That is my result from 1983. Uh, uh, and the method turns out to be a dead end and largely responsible for the three decades because all, all these decades I was trying to improve that method and that just doesn't work. So uh, I wish I didn't have that result. But, uh, okay, so why am I talking about string isomorphism? Because graph isomorphism can be reduced to string isomorphism. This is again Gene Lux's observation. We can encode graphs of n vertices by 0, 1 strings of length n choose 2. Simply, I just list all the pairs and tell which is an edge, which is not an edge. And then two such graphs are isomorphic if and only if they are G isomorphic, where G is going to be the induced action of the symmetric group of n ele on L elements on the n choose 2 pairs. So imagine here is a graph, uh, the, this is a complete graph. Look at the complete graph with n, with five vertices then the symmetric group on these five vertices actually acts also on the 10 pairs of vertices. And that induced action is under which I have to uh, make my 
uh, coded graphs correspond to each other. So the strings of length n choose two correspond to each other under this group. That's what it means that the two graphs that are being encoded by these strings are isomorphic. Okay, so now why are we looking at our groups? If, 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 if all we have to do is consider these very special kinds of groups, the groups that are induced symmetric groups on pairs, then why do we need to look at all groups for this problem? Because that gives us a new tool for recurrence. We are actually going to do a recursion, recursion on the ambient group. So that is Lux's uh, strategy that we take that ambient group and then we split up the group, not the graph. Okay, so uh, Gene also showed that string isomorphism can be solved in polynomial time and there's some conditions on the ambient group. So for instance, the, the, the uh, critical condition that he needed for the bounded degree graph case was if the ambient group is such that every composition factor has bounded order, then string isomorphism can be solved in polynomial time. So Gene discovered this and showed also that this can be used to prove that graph isomorphism for bounded degree graphs can be solved in polynomial time. Okay, all right. Now, our strategy will be to look at the barrier in Gene's method. So Gene solved it under special conditions. We want to solve it without any conditions, so there must be somewhere a, a, a point where that method no longer works. So uh, the symmetric group on a set gamma, that's obviously the largest permutation group on that set, and the alternating group is half of that, is the set of even permutations, and so these are, both of them are way bigger than any other permutation group, so I'm uh, referring to both of them com uh, collectively as the giants. So on every set, there are two giant actions, the symmetric group and the alternating group. And now, <clears throat> the following uh, can be proved. Either there exists an efficient Lux reduction, meaning I have the ambient group, I reduce it to smaller groups, or one can find an epimorphism from the ambient group onto a giant on some other set. Okay, then that other set, of course, cannot be bigger because it has to be an epimorphism. Uh, the complexity of the algorithm is such that this, the degree of that other group, the giant, goes into the exponent. So what we cannot afford is having this giant being, having degree greater than polylogarithmic. Uh, the proof that Gene's algorithm bogs down at this type of situation that uses a result by Peter Cameron uh, uh, that characterizes uh, uh, primitive per large primitive permutation groups, that proof uses uh, the classification of finite simple groups. Okay, so then what is our strategy? Our strategy is that we run, Gene Lux has an algorithm for string isomorphism, and we run it as long as we don't hit the barrier. Once we hit the barrier, then somehow another set magically arises, this set gamma, and I, I will call that the ideal set, and then, then we want, so on the ideal set, we have the symmetric or alternating group action, so it's a completely homogeneous set. It is as symmetrical as, as it gets. And what we want is we want to break that symmetry. So we want to reduce that thing to 90% of itself, and that's the goal. And so that method involves new group theory, and also it involves new combinatorics through the split or Johnson theorem that I already stated. So let's say this is the set uh, which includes the set of positions, and then this is a string, okay? To every position, we associate a letter. I'm going to ignore the string, although it is going to stay in the back of my mind, but focus on the ambient group itself, which permutes the positions. And then in the Lux situation, we have another set, the ideal domain, which uh, which, on which we have a giant action of this group. So we have an epimorphism from our uh, ambient group onto the giant symmetric or alternating group on this ideal domain. Okay, so it's the ideal domain. Okay, it's so nice, smooth. The real world is sort of uh, rough. Okay, so this is the barrier situation. And then our goal will be either to confirm 
that the automorphism group of our initial string, which we don't know, actually maps onto, still onto a giant, or else we want to break the symmetry. Breaking the symmetry will mean that we want to find a, a proper subgroup of the symmetric group, preferably much smaller than the symmetric group, such that the image of our, the projection of our automorphism group is inside. And if we can do that, then we can recurse. So that's the goal. We want to encase the image of the automorphism group into a smaller group. Okay, now how do we do this? Uh, okay, here quickly some notations. So the symmetric group uh, on acting on a set omega, that's sim of m, of omega, alternating group also, and, and less than or equal denotes the subgroup. And now here is the central result. Okay, so this is, first of all, the central new concept. This concept was, was the eureka moment of this uh, uh, long quest. And it has a very exact date, actually around noon that day. Um, so, first of all, if you have a permutation group, G, which, is a sub, which acts on the set omega, then the stabilizer of an element of omega just consists of all permutations in this group that fix that element, okay? So that's a classical concept. And now comes the new definition. I'm going to say if we have an epimorphism from the group G to the alternating group on some other set gamma, uh, then I'm going to say that an element of the domain on which the original group G acts is affected by this homomorphism if the stabilizer of that element does not map onto the alternating group. Okay, so the stabilizer is a subgroup, so it may map onto the same group or it may get map on the proper subgroup. If it's a proper subgroup, then I say that that element of omega, the original domain, was affected. Okay, so. Of course, the definition means nothing without an accompanying theorem, so here is the theorem. I call it the unaffected stabilizer's lemma. What it says is the following. So we have this situation that we have this uh, homomorphism onto a giant, uh, and, and uh, let U denote the set of unaffected elements. And I am going to look at the pointwise stabilizer of the unaffected elements. So these are those elements of which the stabilizer still maps onto the entire alternating group. Then under some condition, it follows that even the pointwise stabilizer, which is the intersection of all these stabilizers, even that maps onto the alternating group. Okay? The condition is that the, that the, 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 the size of the domain gamma, the size of the ideal domain, which I denote by the letter M, is greater than the logarithm of the size of the original domain. So it can be pretty small, but not too small. That's the condition. And under this condition, the claim is that if I have this situation that G maps onto the alternating group on the, in the ideal domain, and I look at the pointwise stabilizer of all the unaffected points, that still maps onto the alternating group. Okay, so here is an illustration. So is, here is the group G, here's the alternating group, and I have, a, I have an epimorphism there. And here is the stabilizer of a point, that's a sub, subgroup. But I am looking at points that are unaffected, that means that they themselves also map onto the same alternating group. And of course, there are a few of them. And I look at the intersection of all of those. And then the surprising thing is that that still maps onto that alternating group. Okay, so here is, we are back to the theorem, and <clears throat> um, I'd like to mention corollary, at least one point is affected. I usually ask the audience to answer that question, but since my time is running out, let's just see why is at least one point affected. If none of the points were affected, that would mean, what would that mean? That, that all points are unaffected then we fix the unaffected points pointwise, that means we fix all the points. But if we fix all the points, then only the identity permutation remains. But if only the identity remains, it's not going to be mapped onto the alternating group on, the, on that, that, that uh, not too small set. Okay, all right. The result is tight 
Okay, the condition is that m must be greater than two plus base two log of m. If we instead allow greater than or equal, then there are already infinitely many counterexamples that are counterexamples in the stronger sense that there will be no affected point. I don't have time to give the proof, but the proof is very simple. It is just a semi-direct product of a, a vector space over the two element field times the alternating group, okay? So it is part of the affine group and the arithmetic works out. Next comment, the proof of this uses the classification of finite simple groups through what is called Schreier's hypothesis, which is very easy to state. The outer automorphism group of every finite simple group is solvable, so I do not have to need, for this proof, I didn't have to go through the list of finite simple groups, just, just uh, pull, pull this, this result out of the hat. And this is a theorem. This is a theorem based on the classification of finite simple groups. Pieber recently overcame this classification obstacle and showed that if m, instead of being greater than logarithm, it's greater than some constant power of the logarithm, then, then one can prove the same result without the classification of finite simple groups. And this would also be enough to justify the quasi-polynomial claim. Okay. But then the question is, okay, how is this related to the string isomorphism problem? Okay, so here is the strategy. We use the unaffected stabilizer lemma to construct global automorphisms from local information. And I put a red exclamation point there. This is the biggest thing. This is something that doesn't happen. If you only have local information, you are not going to infer global symmetry. But there is a situation where you can do it, and this is based on the unaffected stabilizer lemma. This was the breakthrough in this uh, entire quest. Then, using this, uh, one can construct a canonical theory relational structure on the ideal set. Now, wait a minute, what does this mean? The ideal set was completely homogeneous. There was an alternating or symmetric group acting on it, and all of a sudden, now we canonically put a structure there. We, we at least implicitly, we reduced the, uh, the symmetry. That's already an implicit symmetry breaking. Then the next thing is doing some combinatorial refinement tricks. We reduce the the theory to binary. Then we have a graph. And to the graph, we apply Splitter Johnson. That breaks the Lux barrier and reduces the instance significantly. So that's uh, sort of an outline, but the essence is really hidden in the first bullet point about which I really didn't say much. Uh, OK. So I'd like to conclude with mentioning paradoxes of the graph isomorphism problem. Let's compare the complexity of the graph isomorphism problem and the factoring problem, factoring integers into prime factors. So in practice, graph isomorphism is easy. So uh, there, there, are, there are very efficient packages that, that solve graph isomorphism for, for any instance that uh, practitioners in any field would want to. On the other hand, we believe that factoring is hard. That's why we can base cryptographic schemes on factoring. So hard instances of graph isomorphism are very difficult to find, whereas factoring, we believe that virtually almost every instance is hard. It is provable that on the average, graph isomorphism is easy, whereas factoring is, hard, is presumed hard on average. The worst case bound now is also considerably down compared to the, what we have for factoring. Factoring stands at moderately exponential graph isomorphism at quasi-polynomial. Okay, so by, by all measures, graph isomorphism is easier than factoring. Okay, well, we are in a debate situation where the opposite view also has some support. What about the negation? Is non-graph isomorphism in NP? Can we give an, an eff efficiently uh, verifiable witness of non-isomorphism, no, we can't. That's not known. That remains an open problem, whereas for factoring, it has been known for 40 years that one can. So factoring is not only in NP, it's also in co-NP. So the, the decision problem that I stated can also be, the no answer also has a short proof. How about quantum computing? Uh, my colleagues in quantum computing have tried hard for more than two decades. To, to discern a quantum advantage in the context of graph isomorphism, and this was not successful. We are not aware of any quantum advantage over classical computers for graph isomorphism. Whereas, uh, for factoring, we know that, that factoring can be done in polynomial time. BQP is the polynomial time with a quantum computer. So, so yeah, so factoring is easier than graph isomorphism, right? 
Thank you. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you.